Hello, everybody. Welcome to the End Time Sanctuary Present Truth Ministries. We are indeed happy that God has given us this opportunity to learn from His Word one of the most crucial and important topic by which every Christian, Seventh-day Adventist Christian, should know. We are going to t discuss today the assurance of salvation in the final investigative judgment. The last session, we have discussed the assurance of salvation. But this one is the assurance of salvation in the final investigative judgment. Because when we talk of assurance, yes. But when it comes to judgment, it seems that church members are going to recoil because it is difficult to stand in the eyes of God, His piercing eyes, the holiness of God, His justice, His righteousness when we face judgment. So I have some questions to ask. Are you certain that when Jesus come, anytime you will be saved. Is there surety of your assurance of salvation in the final investigative judgment? What are the biblical basis of the assurance of your salvation and judgment? How sure is your confidence that you belong to God or the seal by the Holy Spirit as His. What are the surest evidence? If you are not certain of this, what are the reasons behind? How would you resolve this personal life and death problem? As we have known, human nature is incredibly terrible. Because it is the biggest problem of assurance, of salvation, much more in judgment. There are many reasons why Christians are not certain with the assurance of salvation and judgment. Among others, believers with their human nature try to find assurance in the wrong places, in the wrong foundation, and in the wrong sources rather than in the word of God. Try to find their personal terms in their own preferences, in their own agenda, rather than in the terms of God. The divine mandate and agenda, they want their own rather than God in terms of judgment. As Paul said to Israel, seeking to establish their own righteousness and have not submitted to God's righteousness. Romans 10 verse 3. Many have followed Israel's path of self-deception. So we need to understand, Israel, the chosen people of God, and yet, for thousands of years, is only a repeated history of sin, rebellion, and wickedness. And God has given them the exact knowledge how to live to have an assurance, yet Paul says, they are seeking their own righteousness rather than the righteousness of God. They are seeking their own way, their own terms, how to be secure in the final judgment. This is the same problem with all Christians in the world today. Reason. Because we are dealing with a human-centered versus God-centered assurance. Assurance that is tangible has evidence in the sight rather than by faith and unseen. It is easy and attractive and has to do with human effort rather than difficult and challenging. With the struggle of certain sin and some doctrinal misunderstanding, the church belief, immature faith, leadership problem, and many others. In other words, human-centered assurance rather than God-centered assurance. This is a problem. Our problem, the greatest of all our problems that we cannot solve is sin, is 
Only God has that solution. So, we need to understand. Because the assurance in the final judgment for many has been taken for granted or neglected. Why? This issue of assurance, salvation, and judgment are taken for granted by many. So long as they are inside the church, exercise faith, serve God in active participation in missionary activities of the church, and live as a Christian seems enough. Without serious consideration that in the church there are always two kinds of people. The wise and the foolish virgin. The faithful and the unfaithful servant. The wise and the foolish builders. Two trees. Two claimants. The sheep and the goat. The true and the false. Finally, the saved and the unsaved. These two groups do the same things. And only in the time of judgment, the final result will be fully known. So, the issue of surety and certainty of assurance of salvation and judgment are utmost important questions. In terms of our relationship, we need sometimes we need facts, faith, and feeling. We need to draw our assurance from faith in the facts of the scripture and not with our own feeling. Our faith and thus our assurance must stand on the sure promises of the Bible rather than our own feeling. So the biblical order is that it is facts, then faith and feeling. Feelings are responders of the soul or heart. They are to follow and respond our understanding of Scripture. But they are never safe guide to what we should believe or the state of our salvation. Assurance not from our works. Works or biblical changes that occur in our lives are the result of God's grace and can confirm the reality of our life with God. We must be ever so careful, however... In making such subjective ground on the basis of our assurance. For whenever a believer is out of fellowship, he or she can help the appearance of unbeliever, especially the condition in the last for a length of time. So we should not. Because the Bible is telling us that the ten virgins have the feeling that they are saved, but they are not. In fact, Jesus says that in Matthew 7, 21 to 23, they do a lot of miracles, do ministry, and all other things. But in the end, Jesus rejected them. Uh, away from me, you evildoers. You do uh, things that I have not recognized. I do not know you. Because their understanding is feelings. Their security is feelings rather than what the scripture is saying. And so let me share with you foundation and sources of the believer's assurance. One, assurance rests in his word and in the person of Jesus Christ. We have this following text. Second, assurance rests on God's character. Third, assurance rests on God's promises. Fourth, assurance rests on the perfect life, perfect sacrifice, and death and his completed work. Number five, assurance rests on the work of the sealing by the Holy Spirit. And number six, assurance in the multiple roles of Jesus in behalf of humanity. Let's look at this one by one. Assurance in God's word and in the person of Christ. We know already that the scripture says, the scripture makes us wise unto salvation through faith in Christ. We go to the scripture. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. John 5, 24. Truly, I say to you, he who believes in me has eternal life. John 6, 47. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son 
of God does not have life, these things I have written to you that you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. 1 John 5, 12 and 13. So the assurance is in God's word and in the person of Jesus Christ who told us to be assured. Jesus says, all the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who have sent me. John 6, 37 and 38. This is an assurance. We need to grasp it, not by our feeling. But our faith in the word, the living word of God, and in the person of Jesus Christ, who he left heaven and become human because he loves us so much. And so we have to trust in his word and in his person and in his character. In fact, Jude says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy. Jude 24. Therefore, he is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives and make intercession for them. Hebrews 7.25. In fact, Jesus told Martha and Mary, Lazarus was already dead for four days. And they were crying. It's a normal reaction when we lost somebody. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet he shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? John 11, 25 and 26. So that's the foundation. Jesus' word. We have to believe what he says. And what we, we believe what he says because there is nothing that he speaks that is not truth. Let us not trust our feelings, our emotion that we are saved. Let us exercise faith. They are needed. In fact, Paul says in Romans 8.16, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. There is the Holy Spirit who testify, who witness that we are children of God. Unless, otherwise, you think you are not the children of God. And Jesus says again in John 10, 28, 29, I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will stop them, snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one can snatch them out of my father's hand. That is an assurance. It's a luck. It's an eternal. But we need to do our response. Paul says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed in the day of your redemption. Ephesians 4.39 Most assuredly I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. John 5.47 So we have this a lot, a lot from the Old and New Testament. Hundreds upon hundreds of texts. The assurance is there. The problem is that human nature. We have not put into the memory even memorizing all these texts for our assurance. The assurance is crystal clear. Most assuredly, I see to you, Jesus says, he who believes in me has eternal life. John 6, 47. The question is that, do you have Jesus? These things I have written to you, you believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know you may have eternal life. The problem also is that many Christians does not know what is the meaning of eternal life. We'll discuss that one of these issues. What's really eternal life? What's the difference this life now that I have? And when is the eternal life given? Today or future? Because they do not know. Many of us did not know 
what it means to have eternal life. I had a seminar in one place in Mindanao. And many of us, what do you mean by eternal life? Because many have re- heard this word and assumed that they know, but actually they do not know. So that's a problem. That's why we have no assurance. Jesus Christ is the foundation and the source of our assurance and his word. It is faith in the person of Jesus Christ that we find an anchor assurance of our salvation through faith in his word. And Jesus really lacked that. Jesus made it so clear. You search the scripture for in them. You think you have eternal life. And these are they that testify of me. John 5, 39. But as for me, I will watch expectantly. For the Lord, I will wait for God. My salvation, my God will hear me. That's Old Testament prophet Micah is saying. Micah 7, verse 7. The Lord is my strength, my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will extol him. Exodus 15, 2. Now become so personal. My God is my strength, my song, my salvation. I will praise him. The closeness is an assurance. We need to understand that Our assurance does not come come inside. It is from outside. The author and the owner of our lives. So we have to understand this. It's repeated in many passages in the Bible. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not afraid. For the Lord God is my strength, my song. He has become my salvation. Isaiah 12, verse 2. Very incredible promises. Why incredible of its security, surety, and it is really unchangeable. Since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I have loved you, I will give people in exchange for you, nation, exchange of your life. Isaiah 43, 4. You make your saving help my shield. Your right hand sustain me. You help me has made me great. You provide a broad path on my feet so that my ankles do not give way. Psalms 18, 35 and 36. Heal me, O Lord, and I will be healed. Save me and I will be saved for you are my praise. Jeremiah 17, 14. So it's clear. Let us not look somewhere. What is wrong is that we look somewhere to find assurance, to people, to events, to history of our lives. These are not. Let's go to the Bible, because if the Bible is the only way that would guide us to heaven, that should be our highest priority. Let's go now to the assurance, surety, certainty in God's character. I'm so interested with this one for the reason that I want to share it with you. Because to me, this word, for my own sake, for his name's sake, is really a strong, solid foundation of our assurance. I, even I, he who blots out your transgression for my own sake. And I will not remember your sin. Isaiah 43, 25. What does this mean for my own? His character. Take it to the bank. Because sure can be trusted for my own sake. I read a lot of passages from scripture that tells me. When I committed sin, I asked forgiveness to the Lord. It is not me who is deserving to be forgiven. But his character is the assurance. My own sake, 
His own personhood, His own authority, His own love. And it was repeated many times. Psalm 25, 11, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. It's not I am deserving. If you understand what happened to Exodus, I will visit them because I love them. Because of my name, I'm going to redeem them. We are not really deserving. And yet, because of his character, that is the surest assurance that we, as his people, will get what he promised. Look at this again in Daniel 9, verse 17. Nevertheless, he saved them for this, for his name's sake. Not, excuse me, this is not Daniel. Psalm 106, verse 8. For his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. And again in Daniel 9, 17. Now therefore, our God, hear our prayer, your sub, your servant, his supplication for the Lord's sake. Cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. It is his character, is the guarantee, is the assurance for his name's sake. For my name's sake, I will defer my anger. And for my praise, I will restrain it from you so that I do not cut you off. Behold, I will refine you, but not as a silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction for my own sake. For my own sake, I will do it. For how should my name be profane and I will not give glory to another? Isaiah 48, 9, and 11. That's the character of God. We don't deserve. But his character that is trustworthy, absolutely reliable, because what he speaks is a truth, an absolute truth. That is the basis why we have to enjoy the assurance while we are serving God. His character is our unshakable confidence. Look at these long passages in Samuel. Then Samuel said to the people, Do not fear. You have done all this wickedness, yet do not turn aside from following the Lord. And serve the Lord with all your heart, and do not turn aside, for then you would go after empty things which cannot profit or deliver for are nothing. For the Lord will not forsake his people, his great name's sake, because it has pleased the Lord to make you his people. First Samuel 12, 20 and 22. During the time of Samuel, the people really committed wickedness, but say, do not turn aside, do not leave the Lord, because his great name's sake, it is his pleasure to make you as his people. Ezekiel 20 verse 14, the same is saying, I acted in my name's sake, that it should be not be profane before the Gentile, in whose sight I had brought them out. And many passages, for I will defend this city, for save it for my own sake and for my servant David. Here is really an absolute, unshakable confidence. His character, his person, his word, his authority. Why? We are doubting with our assurance. This is our God. This is our God. We need. But if our relationship with him is questionable, then... We lost confidence and assurance because we are looking at ourselves rather than looking to the God who promises with confidence and unshakable surety that we will really have his assurance. Let's go to the salvation and judgment. It's, a, it's a really a problem. Preacher and evangelist have this solemn biblical pronouncement. 
during evangelistic effort. They will recite, For God shall bring every work into judgment, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be bad. Ecclesiastes 12, 14. Then we start to recoil. Why? Because judgment has been spoken. What I read in the Bible is that I should not be afraid of judgment. But many of all the topics in the Bible, people are reluctant, doubting, have a little or big problem when judgment becomes the topic. Because a lot of text is telling us that the judgment of God is not really easy. For example here, Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment of God. Psalm 1 verse 5. If we think we are ungodly, how can we stand? For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. 2 Corinthians 5.10 Who will not tremble with such pronouncement? Of truth. Where is the assurance of salvation in such court of final judgment? We say it is impossible. But I would say no. That is not the truth. God's truth is secured and assured his people. But wait. David prayed, judge me, O Lord. Psalm 7, 8. Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. Psalms 26, verse 1. Judge me, O Lord, O Lord my God, according to your righteousness. Psalms 35, 24. Judge me, O God. Psalms 43, 1. How could David pray such prayer? Hurry up, Lord, since judgment. Bring it on, Lord. I cannot wait. Did he understand how was serious was his sin? Of his adulterous affair and his murderous action of killing the husband of Bathsheba. But why is it? His really urgency of saying, Lord, please judge me. Because he knows the person. He knows his God. Listen, what a rejoicing and immediate judgment that is welcome. He prayed. Others have the same intention. Arise, O God, judge the earth. The enjoy judgment. But why we need to flee? This is a big problem. God's people are rejoicing in judgment. Look at there in Psalm 96, verses 11 to 13. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. The sea roar and its fullness. Let the field be joyful and all that is in it. Then all the trees of the woods. This is personification, a symbol of God's people. Will rejoice before the Lord. He is coming, for He is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world in righteousness and the people with His truth. Be glad. Rejoice. What a picture. My brothers and sisters. The final judgment should not make us terrified. If we know our Lord, our knowledge of Him in His characters, and many times I read Ellen White, why many Christians are afraid of judgment? Because they do not know their God. They serve Him, yet they have no personal connection, relation with Him. Why is such eagerness in answering judgment? The Hebrew people know that God's purpose of building the sanctuary in the camp 
where the people dwell in the camp of the sinners, Jesus lived a perfect life for us who believes in him and trust in his work. If you try to look at the sanctuary, in the outer court, in the altar born offering, symbolizes the cross, Jesus dies as a perfect offering, and Jesus as our offering is perfect, that is already an assurance. When we go to move to the labor, symbolize the cleansing, the newness of life and regeneration that is he promised by his Holy Spirit that he will regenerate us. We have to walk a new life when we have a living connection with our Lord. When we move to the first apartment, the holy place, the lampstand, light that symbolizes the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The showbread symbolizes the word of God. Jesus is the bread of life. The altar of incense, the symbol of Christ's righteousness as a, ascending with our prayers. The activities of Jesus in the sanctuary and the high priest in the Old Testament, what Jesus doing in the sanctuary after his ascension is really an assurance. We need to understand, there is no salvation without judgment. Judgment first, then salvation. We look at that in the second apartment. The Ark of the Covenant expresses God's law, the standard of judgment. The gold cover of the Ark, the mercy seat, symbolizes God's mercy in dealing those who break the law covered by Jesus as a sin offering and an offerer. They took care of him. The house of angels involved in the interest in executing the plan of redemption for the Hebrews, Jews, the pictorial of the entire plan of salvation, atonement, forgiveness, justification, confession, sanctification. Judgment. Paul assert, let God be true, though every man be false as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Romans 3, 4. So in the sanctuary, assurance of salvation and judgment stand clear. The problem, as I said, because we find assurance and surety from a wrong place, from a wrong foundation, from a wrong sources, rather than what God has given to us. Exceedingly good news from the sanctuary. You know, the book of Hebrew, Hebrews was written and it culminates in the most wonderful Good news in salvation. When the people of God walk in the ancient times, in the Christian time, in the end, where did they arrive? But you have come to Mount Zion. Now we reach the headquarters of God. To the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly of the church of the firstborn, who are registered or enrolled in the books of heaven, to God the judge of all, to the spirit of just men made perfect, to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant, that is the heavenly sanctuary, and to the blood, that is the death of the cross, of sprinkling, speak better things that of Abel. Hebrews 12, 24 There are two significant words. The Christian has arrived. Let us rejoice. Because their names are registered in the book of heaven. And they are just made perfect because of the mediator of the new covenant. What an assurance. The allusion was that of investigative judgment in the heavenly sanctuary. Firstborn from the Greek word prototokos. In this context means... A special, unique relationship 
to God through faith in Jesus Christ. The firstborn. Sad to say, many interpreter will read that one. Ah, the firstborn church. Firstborn, prototokos, does not mean firstborn. But it means the quality of relationship, unique relationship to God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the good news. And Hebrews 12 indicates that God the Father, the judge of all the earth, are the people, judging the people who are registered in the book of heaven and the book of life and the book of remembrance. They were justified and made perfect. The Greek word is titilestai. When we arrive in the headquarters of God, we get the benefit of Jesus' magician in the sanctuary because we are registered as firstborn, the prototokos, the unique relationship of God through our faith in Jesus Christ. He says, He made it perfect. The fullness lack nothing through the blood of the mediator, Jesus Christ. Thus, Christ's exaltation, installation, inauguration in the heavenly sanctuary, mediation is certainty, the surety of the believer's salvation. Let's go now to the multiple roles in saving humanity. In earthly court, this is not possible. Even in the Western court, this is not. But in the Bible, multiple rule has been presented in many parts of scriptures. One of that is how you read the book of Judges. To us, Judges is to judge. But the book of Judges says, God raised the Judges to deliver the people. The deliverer, the protector, the savior. Can you imagine that? Not to judge, to condemn. But rather to deliver. So, Christ has seven multiple rules in saving us. In connection to the sanctuary. Let's look at each of this. Because in the sanctuary portrayed in Daniel, Christ... The heavenly high priest is the offer. At the same time, he is the offering. This too is very important. Christ is the offering. He himself is the offerer. That's the sureness. Clear. That is our sport to claim. He is our offering and he is the one who offers. How can you say and doubt that you are not assured? Assurance from our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary. Hebrews 2, 14 to 17, our high priest had flesh and blood. Human nature, merciful and faithful, helping the seed of Abraham, the father of righteousness, of faith by faith covenant. We're assured because Jesus took the nature of human rather than angels. He can understand our situation, our dilemma, our nature. He took it. So he understands when we are tempted. He understands when we fall into sin. He understands us whatever situation because he took human nature. Number two. Our high priest sympathized with our human frailness and weakness. According to Hebrews 4, 15 to 17. Hebrews 16, 17, 6, 17, 20. Our high priest paved the way for us to God. He made our pathway going to God the Father. He did it all. What we need to know is accept by faith and walk. Hebrews chapter 8, verse 6 and 9, 24. Our mediator, advocate, defender, high priest, offering. Wow. He mediate. Advocate.
advocate. He is a defender. What a closeness. What a comfort. When we have such a clear role of Jesus. Assurance is by substitution provided by God. Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteem him stricken, smitten of God, afflicted. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his strip, stripes we are healed. We are like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. For the transgressions of my people, he was stricken. Isaiah 53, 4 and 6. Just imagine that. He carried our sin, our transgression. He was wounded. He died on the cross that he has nothing to share. That's an assurance. So we are assured not only in his word, in his person, but his Work that he provided atonement by substitution. Salvation is by substitution. We need to understand what this word some substitution. The word substitution is very rarely used, but the concept is very much evident. Substitute is used in theology is primarily a person performing the function instead of another. Salvation by substitution in a biblical concept doesn't mean saving a life by a mere assistant, a throwing of a rope to a drowning person, or by risking one's life to save another. That is play, basketball, substitute, volleyball, substitute. But that is not the substitution what has in the Bible. Salvation by substitution does mean that Christ, as a substitute, took on himself the sinner's guilt and bore its penalty instead of a sinner. Or Paul put it, but God demonstrated his love towards us that while we're still sinners, Jesus died for us. Romans 5, 7. Salvation by substitution is organically linked with sacrifice. Paul, in his correspondence with the Corinthian Christian, writes, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. The most specific identification, Christ's self-giving as a sacrifice, is in Ephesians that says, And walk in love as Christ also loves us, and given himself for us, and an offering and a sacrifice for God, a sweet smelling aroma. Ephesians 5 2. That is a substitution. That instead, us, in the day of judgment, that's why when I explain that, what is investigative judgment? Because it's not literal that we stand before the judgment of God. We call that. Investigative judgment is an investigative that is in absentia. Your own record, there is somebody. And then there is a mediator. There is a record of all. You are judged. I am judged. Not in the presence of God. Because in the presence of God, if we are judged in the presence of God, simply we just dissolve because of His holiness. Because of His righteousness. He is a consuming fire. So salvation by substitution is a real promise. Now, all things are of God, who reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. He has given us the ministry of reconciliation, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Romans 5 18 and 20. He had no sin, but God made him as a sin. A substitute. Who gave himself for us 
that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify himself, his own people, zealous for good works, according to Titus 2.14. So, now we have laid the substitution. Let's look at now the seven roles of Jesus in saving humanity. I discussed that in part. Number one, Christ our substitute. What does God think of Christ as our substitute? When we are in Christ, we may know that we are accepted in the beloved. Ephesians 1 6. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. He himself is a ransom for all. That word takes long time when we explain ransom. Ransom is that you are already in the position of the enemy. Nowhere you can get out. He has paid the ransom. 1 Timothy 2, 6, Titus 2, 14, and Galatians 1, verses 4, and chapter 2, verse 20. So, according to Ellen White, we may enjoy the favor of God. We are not to be anxious about what Christ and God think of us, but about what God think of Christ as our substitute. We are really human-centered rather than God-centered because salvation, it's God's work. It's not ours. Salvation is an offer. We need to understand that. The problem is sometimes is that we think we can contribute something to our own salvation. Let me read a longer passages statement from Ellen White Steps to Christ. Since we are sinful and holy, we cannot perfectly obey the law. We have no righteousness of our own which to meet the claims of the law of God. But Christ has made a way of escape for us. He lived on earth amidst trials and temptation. Such we have to meet. He lived a sinless life. He died for us. Now he offers to take our sin and gives us his righteousness. If you give yourself to him and accept him as your savior, then sinful as your life may have been, for his sake you are counted righteous. Christ's character stand in the place of your character and you are accepted before God just as if you have not seen. Step to Christ, page 62. Beautifully, powerful words. The problem is that we do not know who Jesus is. We serve him, but we have no intimate relationship we are stranger to him rather than the closeness because when we know his character, his character is our assurance. Number two, Christ as our lawyer, advocate, and mediator. Why are you afraid of judgment? If Jesus is your lawyer, your advocate, your mediator, what is that? So like the Holy Spirit in John 14, 16 and 16, 17 means Paracletos, a comporter, an advocate, is a person who summon, called to one side, especially called to one's aid. First John 2, Verse 1, if anyone sins, we have an advocate, paracletos, with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. We have a lawyer. We have an advocate. Why are you afraid of final investigative judgment? An advocate is the one who pleads another's cause before a judge, a pleader, a counsel for defense, legal assistance, an advocate, one who pleads another cause with one, an intercessor of Christ. In his exaltation at God's right hand, 
pleading with God the Father for the pardon of our sin. According to Paul in 2 Timothy 2, verse 5, and Hebrews 8, verse 6, as mediator means one who intervenes between the two, either in order to make or to restore peace and principle, defend or form a compact, or for ratifying a covenant. Our heavenly advocate has never lost a case that has been committed to him. The assurance of Jesus, of those whom you have given me, I have, not lo I have lost none. John 8, 18 verse 9. In the heavenly assize, Christ eloquently, persuasively pleads our case based upon his blood. Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, that is the sanctuary in heaven, purifying blood which pleads more insistently, that was Hebrew 12, 14 says. Prophet Micah expands it, until he pleads my case and execute justice for me, he will bring me forth to light and I will see his righteousness. Micah 5, 7. Ellen White says in the Great Controversy 484, Christ does not excuse their sins, but show their penitence and faith and claiming them forgiveness. He left his wounded hands before the Father and holy angels saying, I know them by name. I have graven them in my palms, in my hands. What an assurance in investigative judgment. Number three. Christ is the star witness in our behalf. In one of the seven churches of Revelation, Laodicea, the name means people of judgment. Jesus' title in this church is Faithful and True Witness. In the book of John, Apostle repeatedly used this title of Jesus, Witness. Christ, our substitute, lawyer, advocate, but also as a divine faithful witness, he testified in behalf of his people as their, as their star witness before the Father. What an assurance. Number four, Christ as our judge. While on earth, Jesus claimed, the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment into the sand, John 5, 22. We have described that the basis of our acceptance in judgment is justification by faith. The ground of our salvation in judgment is totally what Christ has done for us by shedding his blood for pardon of our sins and covering us with his righteousness. This is the only ultimate and the only foundation of our assurance in judgment. He assures, I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own, but my own will, but will of the Father who sent me. John 6, 30. The believer's assurance in judgment that Christ, our judge, is, one in, is on our side. All the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast. Out. What an assurance. Number five. He is our purifier. In the end time pre advent judgment, Malachi portrays the cleansing of the work of the Messiah, the messenger of the covenant. He is like a refiner's fire, like a rounder's saw. He will sit as a refiner and purify the silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver, that they may be offered to the Lord, offering of righteousness, Malachi 3. Two. Meaning to say, He will purify us. He will cleanse us. The same is catological judgment, where prophet Ezekiel shows the cleansing of God's people. Then I will sprinkle them with clean water on you, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your all idol. 
I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of the flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk my statues and you will keep my judgment and do them. Ezekiel 36, 25, 27. We discussed that. For my name's sake, he will cleanse us. That's really a good news in salvation. In the purification and cleansing, the question is, who takes responsibility for the cleansing? In Leviticus 16, 30, asserts, the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you. The messenger of the cabinet will purify the sons of Levi. I'm the Lord, cleanse you. God himself assumes ultimate responsibility for cleansing. Even I, I am, who blots out your transgression for my own sake. I will remember not your sin. Isaiah 43, 25. What a blessing. What an assurance. What a hope. What a comfort. Let me read a statement from Ellen White. Selected Messages, Volume 1, 353, 354. There are conscious souls that trust partly to God. This is dangerous. There are conscious, conscientious souls that trust partly. They trust God in part, in portion. And partly to themselves. They do not look to God to be kept by His power, but depend upon the watchfulness against temptation and performance of certain duty for acceptance with Him. They are no victories in these kinds of faith. Actually, when you trust God partially, it's equal to nothing. That will never work. Such person toil to no purpose of their soul in continual bondage and they find no rest until their burdens are laid at the feet of Jesus. There is a need of constant wastefulness and of earnest loving devotion, but this will come naturally when the soul is kept by the power of God through faith. We can do nothing, absolutely nothing, to commend ourselves to a divine favor. Trust holy. Give all. The problem is that when we surrender, we think we are weak, but before God, we are strong. We must not trust ourselves. Not to our own good works. But when as earring sinful being come to Christ, we may find rest in his love. God will accept everyone that comes to him, trusting wholly in the merits of a crucified Savior. Love springs from the heart. There may be no ecstasy of feeling, but there is abiding peaceful trust. Every burden is light, for the yoke of Christ imposes is easy. Duty becomes delight. Sacrifice becomes a pleasure. The path before seems shrouded with darkness becomes bright and the beams of the sun of righteousness. This is walking in the light of Christ in the last as he is in the light. What a statement. The psalmist prayed, Vindicate me, O Lord, my God, According to your righteousness, let them rejoice over me. The result of investigative judgment is portrayed in Daniel. It's the great assurance to God's people until the ancient days came and the judgment was made in favor of the saint of the Most High and the time came for the saint to possess the kingdom. Daniel 7.22 What an assurance. It's clear in Daniel. He is on our side. But the question is, are you in the side of God? The patriarch Job longs, for I know that my vindicator lives. 
that in the last he will stand upon the earth after my skin had been destroyed, then my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see on my side. Job 19.25-27 to 27. This, The assurance of Job. He's vindicated. He will see him on his side. Ellen White captured the picture of our final vindication in the pre-advent investigative judgment. This is what she says. In the investigative judgment, their lives and character are brought in review before God. And that solemn tribunal reverses the decision of their enemies. What's the decision of their enemies? Are they are sinners? They have weaknesses. They have not really, they are not qualified for heaven. But God in judgment and review, the tribunal reverses the decisions of the enemy. Their faithfulness to God and his word stand revealed. And in heaven's high honor are rewarded them, conquerors in the strife with Satan and Satan. Our high calling 361. Being confident, Paul says in Philippians, this very thing, he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus. God is working us day by day, hour by hour, in us, inside us. Because the part of our salvation is to consent, according to Ellen White. You have no other part but to consent. Whether you consent what God proposes. And in this I pray, your love may be abound still more and more knowledge and all discernment. That you may approve the things that are excellent. That you may be sincere without offense till the day of Christ being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, uh, 9 to 11. The last role of Jesus. Vindication of God. The investigative judgment is not conducted to reveal to God who are His and who are not. He who is omniscient Know who are he is already. A lot of text there. It is for the sake of assurance that on the unlocking universe that those serves in the jury of the cosmic investigative judgment. It is not for your sake that I will act, declared the Lord God. Let it be known to you, Jesus imparts all powers, all grace, all penitence, all inclination, all pardon of sins, in presenting his righteousness for man to grasp by living faith, which is also a gift from God. Vindicated. Here is our problem. Many of us who are thinking that we can contribute a period and a comma to our salvation and our assurance in investigative judgment. Listen to what Ellen White says in Faith and Works, page 24. If you gather together everything that is good and holy and noble and lovely in men, what? You gather all the best you have and then present the subject to the angels of God acting in a part in salvation of human soul or marriage. Result, the proposition would be rejected as treason. Here is a lesson for all time. Our assurance of salvation and judgment is not anchored in anything but in a person, in the personal relationship of Jesus. To obtain such assurance, we must have a correct view of Jesus, the Christ in Scripture. My brothers and sisters, what a message we have this time. It tells us judgment, final judgment, investigative judgment, we have assurance. In his word, in his person, in his character, in what he has done, his completed work, and the multiple roles of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary, 
make us the surety, the certainty that when He comes, we have the fullness of the assurance of salvation in the final judgment that God is on our side. May God bless us as we contemplate what God has provided us as an assurance. Do not listen to the voice of the enemy. Listen to what his word because in his word is a trustworthy, absolute that is our confidence of salvation in the final investigative judgment. This is my prayer.